I would like to start off with Acts chapter number 16. A very familiar passage we've used several times as we've taught through some things regarding salvation. Acts chapter 16, this is when Paul and Silas are in jail. And the Philippian jailer asked him in verse number 30, Acts 16, 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now we've taught some things about salvation, both from a biblical position, which is obviously our final authority and our foundation, and also from a theological position. I've given you some things as far as what the theologians say and even what some churches say regarding salvation, some explanations and so forth, and how we need to understand that in light of the Bible. But really, when you boil it down, the most important thing for anyone is this subject matter of salvation. And here's the question. Is salvation simple? Or is it hard to understand? Is it difficult? Is it confusing? I want to submit to you that if you follow the religions of this world, and I'm speaking of mainline Protestant denominations, not Roman Catholicism, but I'm just lumping all of quote-unquote Christianity, if you want to call it even evangelical Christianity in some sort, into that category. If you consider their teachings, which we're going to do in this message, you could very well walk away scratching your head, confused, clouded, with doubts, with questions, thinking, man, is it that complicated? You know, the Bible says in Mark chapter number 10 in the NIV, verse 24, the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. You know, that's a good verse for a new, new Bible, from a new Bible version to explain the confusion in Christianity regarding salvation. Because for them, it is hard. The Bible, the correct Bible, the authorized King James Bible, says in Mark 10, 24, Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? You see, salvation not, is not presented as something hard or difficult in the Bible. It's presented as something simple and easy. Jesus has already done the work. He bled and died for your sins on the cross you simply have to believe. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Have you ever been to maybe a funeral and you heard the preacher preach and he's just talking in circles? Almost like he's talking like some of the news media, just double speak. They talk and talk and talk and when they get done, you don't know what in the world he said. He's trying to bring comfort. He's talking about peace. He's talking about the afterlife in so many terms, and he's really not clear, he's not straightforward, he's not telling us for sure that that person's either in heaven or in hell, or giving the Bible, the Bible's explanation about what happens at life after death. And you walk away wondering, here's a guy that's a preacher, a minister of the gospel, a reverend, and he can't even tell us how to go to heaven when we die. I mean, here we are, we live 60, 70, 80 years, 100 years, and shoot, after 60 or 70, it's just sorrow and pain and arthritis and everything else. And then you die, and for eternity, where are you going to be? That's a pretty important question. And preachers can't even shoot straight and tell you with a clear-cut Bible answer what you need to do to get to heaven. Some of you, I'm sure, work with people or you have family members. Or I, and I've talked to people that have been influenced by religions, by churches, maybe because they've attended that church as a child. Maybe their loved one or spouse or friend goes to that particular church. And so they've kind of gleaned some doctrinal information from that church. And they're confused as what salvation is. I've asked many a person, what do you think a person has to do to get to heaven? Or I've said, how do you know you're going to heaven? And they'll say, I was baptized. Or I was confirmed. Or I went to church. Or whatever. And they get these ideas from somewhere. And I want to unmask the monster and show you the religious 
confusion that's out there in this message so you can see where this stuff is coming from and hopefully we can clear up the confusion that's out there in these mainline denominations. And we're going to explain the gospel as we do that. Now we spoke some time back with the theories of salvation. We dealt with sacramentalism, which is from the word sacrament. And we'll refer to that several times as we look at some of these churches. The word sacrament comes from the word sacred. It literally means a holy obligation. And when you study the theory of salvation from a sacramental point of view, the idea is that the sacraments themselves impart and help the person achieve salvation. They confer grace. That's why the Bible, the King James Bible, never uses the word sacrament. Amen. And you shouldn't either. You say, well, there's two sacraments in the church. We have baptism and then we have communion or the Lord's Supper. No, there's no such thing as a Bible sacrament at all. Now, Roman Catholicism teaches emphatically, and I've given you material on that before, so we won't belabor the point, and we're not even going to deal with the harlot Rome in this message. But Roman Catholicism teaches that sacraments are signs of grace, and they're efficacious. In other words, they, they give salvation. And they're instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed. That's what they teach. And they have seven sacraments, and you have to follow and take of those sacraments in order to obtain salvation. Now, I'm going to deal with Protestantism, and we can, like I say, use a broader term, evangelicalism. We're not going to deal with all of the non-denominational groups, and I'm trying to deal with some of the major groups that you may encounter and read about when you study Christianity. I'm not really going to include the Baptist denomination simply for the fact that when you consider Protestantism, the Baptists have been hated by Protestants all the way back when you study Luther and Zwingli and some of the Reformers. The Anabaptists, they rose up and they were ready to pretty much say bye-bye to all of Rome's heresies, some of which Luther and the Reformers were willing to hang on to, and they did. And so the Baptists have always been despised, so we're not going to include them. When you study Baptists, as far as a denomination worldwide, it's a huge group. The Southern Baptists in and of themselves, 14.8 million. It's a very large denomination here in the United States. Now, we're going to start off with the Lutheran Church. Now, when I say Lutheran Church, I'm going to cite the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA. In the United States, they have 4 million members. And you can check all of this material. You can simply go to their websites. I did not diverge from that and go to websites that were attacking those belief systems. I stayed in, on the mainline denomination websites and got their material straight from there. Sometimes they would have articles which they would endorse and they would put links to those articles on those websites. So this is all the materials coming straight from them. And I'll give some quotes here and we'll comment. This first portion is from an article titled A Lexicon of Faith Salvation by Peter W. Marty. The Bible offers many meanings of the verb to save. This variety hasn't deterred some believers from settling into a narrow definition. In fact, if someone were to ask you if you have been saved, you can pretty much assume that individual is connecting salvation with a destination more than with a present reality. Listening to more follow-up questions, you will probably get the distinct impression that salvation has to do with gaining access to heaven. Some people receive an entry ticket while others do not. If the whole conversation leaves you confused or uncomfortable, it may be because you detect more threat than promise behind your friend's interpretation of salvation. Now this guy's taking a shot at Bible believing at the Bible believing truth of the gospel because we do talk about being saved as far as a destination is concerned. Now when we teach the scriptures obviously we talk about salvation in the present tense but the Bible speaks of a destination that you're going to be whether it be in heaven or in hell and we're not going to apologize from that. But this is the evangelical Lutheran church in America, a very liberal church. And you'll notice that there's some hints here as we go a little bit further 
where they imply and they push their Calvinistic tendencies. Quote, In our modern culture's denial of a need for salvation where self-improvement strategies leave little room for God to work, we should remember that salvation is not about us. It is about God. Okay, I understand. I mean, we started off with the whole study on salvation, coerced or compelled. Salvation's God, God's idea, not ours. However, you've got to make a decision where you want to spend eternity. He says, why will you die, O house of Israel, back in the Old Testament? Choose you this day whom you will serve, Joshua 24. It's about God. It is not a decision we make. Oh, really? Why does Paul say, behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation? Why does he say to the jailer there, believe on the Lord Jesus? He's pushing him for a decision. It is not a decision we make. It is a free gift God has already made who for us and our salvation came down from heaven, as the Nicene Creed puts it. Here's another article. It's called, By the Light of Grace, How Does the ELCA Understand Heaven and Hell? Since God is not a place, and the absence of God is also not a place, we can help people focus on their relationship with the triune God and their lives now, rather than focus on fears and the question, where will I go when I die? Now these are preachers, and these are theologians and people in these denominations. This is where this stuff is trickling down from. And so therefore you have the preachers and the priests and the pastors in these churches with very broad generalities and they do not want to deal with the issue of life after death because number one, they don't know where they're going when they die. So therefore, they've got to flatten out the dogmatic truth of the gospel. Here's uh, ELCA, Director for Theological Ethics and ELCA that's the Evangelical Lutheran Churches of America, liaison for faith and science, Roger Weiler. The story and author, others like it in the New Testament teach that God and Christ is in charge of the blessing of heaven and the judgment of hell. We are not. He's speaking of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Moreover, the judgment of hell results from stubborn unbelief, not fearing, loving, and trusting God above all else. And he quotes Luther's small catechism there. So that the Gospel of John, that in the Gospel of John, punishment for this complete lack of trust occurs already in this life. Then he quotes John 3, 18 and 19. Uh, he, whoever believeth not is condemned already. And you can go on further down and quote John 3, 36. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That doesn't mean the guy's walking around in hell. But God's wrath can be on you and you not be in hell. The wrath of God is hovering over an unsaved man. So he's quoting that, trying to justify saying that people that aren't believers, they're already in this state of a, of a present lack of trust. Here we go. Because the Bible says so little about this, our human curiosity kicks into high gear and we want to know more than we can or should. Indeed, as soon as we begin prying into God's business and take judgment into our own hands, we miss the point. We might better say about heaven and hell that yes, they exist, but that whether they are full or empty is up to God, not us. Do you believe in heaven or hell? All right, who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Can you as a preacher tell us what the Bible says about that? If a preacher can't tell you what the Bible says about what a person has to do or not do to go to heaven or hell, you need to quit listening to it. Because you, my friend, are going to die and face judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews chapter 10. You better be ready. We might be better to say about heaven and hell, yes, they exist, but whether they're full and empty is up to God. It's not up to us to judge. We can't say who's going to heaven or hell. We don't know who is elect and who's not elect. Here's another one by Frank G. Honeycutt, saved for, not from, grounded in grace. Quote, salvation is not some future status bestowed on the well-behaved after death. I'd agree with that. 
If you're saved, you have eternal life right now. That's not something you're hoping to get after you die. And we never teach, and the Bible and the New Testament, as far as salvation, New Testament never teaches that the well-behaved are the ones who get salvation. He says, salvation begins now. We are saved for a particular calling from God, a specific purpose. Here we go. The call begins with baptism. Now, the Lutherans, back in 1999, they came up with the Catholics with a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. If you know when you study justification, you obviously run into Martin Luther because he nailed the 95 Thesis on the wall, on the door at Wittenberg, and he declared, of course, the five solas, but you have mainly justification by faith. And that whole idea from Martin Luther is obviously the mantra of the Reformation. And it resounds throughout Lutheranism as well. However, it was a huge contradiction with Roman Catholic teaching on justification. Totally different deal. We don't have time to get into that. I've preached on justification. You can go and listen to those where we've gotten into some of the Roman Catholic idea of their uh, rewards and their merits and so forth. Here in 1999, the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church came up with this document called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. It was created and agreed by the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation. That's about 74 million Lutherans. In 2006, the World Methodist Council voted to adopt it. That's about 80 million. In 2017, the World Communion of Reformed Churches, that's 80 to 100 million. That includes congregational churches, Reformed, Presbyterian, some Presbyterian churches, United, and some Waldensian churches. 80 to 100 million adopted it in 2017. And I'll give you some of the points. Number 11 of the document, of the dec joint declaration. Justification is the forgiveness of sins. We don't have time to get into that, but it is not. Justification is not the same as pardon. Anyway, liberation from the dominating power of sin and death and from the curse of the law. It is acceptance into communion with God already now, but then fully in God's coming kingdom. It unites with Christ and with His death and resur resurrection. It occurs in the reception of the Holy Spirit in baptism and incorporation into the one body. Now you're going to see this thing cropping up. That's why you run into it when you're at the water cooler and you say, Hey, have you ever been saved? And they say, I've been baptized. Because they say the stuff starts, the stuff, salvation starts at baptism. Justification starts at baptism. All this is from God alone. See that double speak? You've got to try to be like, Oh, it's all of God. It's not of our works. For Christ's sake, by grace through faith in the gospel of God's Son. Number 15, in faith we together hold the conviction that justification is the work of the triune God. The Father sent His Son into the world to save sinners. The foundation and presupposition... So here's the problem. I'm going to get this, but the problem is not some of the things they say, even in Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism teaches Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried, rose again from the dead, and He's going to come back. The problem is how they swerve around and how they say certain things and then what they add to the gospel. And you begin to add leaven to something, a little leaven, Galatians chapter 5, leavens the whole lump. You add a little bit of works to salvation, you do not have Bible salvation, New Testament salvation. The Father sent His Son into the world to save sinners. The foundation and presupposition of justification is the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. Justification thus means that Christ Himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. Together we confess, together Roman Catholics and Lutherans, and then others that join in to this resolution. By grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. Number 16. All people are called by God to salvation in Christ. Through Christ alone we are justified when we receive this salvation in faith. Faith is itself God's gift through the Holy Spirit who works through word and sacrament in the community of believers and who at the same time leads believers into that renewal of life which God will bring to completion in eternal life. 
Two things you need to notice. They're saying that you've got to have, yeah, the Word of God. Oh, of course we've got to have the Bible. Did you say that the Catholics don't believe the same Bible that you Protestants believe? No, you're not going to talk about that. Anyway, you've got to have the Word. Yeah, you've got to have the Gospel, but you also have to have the sacraments. And then he says, the renewal of life which God will bring to completion. In other words, your salvation is a continual process. We're going to see Calvinism and Arminianism in religion as we get a little later on with the Methodists and with the Pentecostals. We're going to see both of these things and see how they both pervert the gospel of the grace of God. It's a continual thing. How do you really know you're one of the elect? Because you endure unto the end. How do you really know that you're saved? And you have to even be careful if you look on the Southern Baptist Convention website with their statement of faith, you know at the end, I think it's the very last point there, where it talks about their belief as far as salvation is concerned. And everything's spot on except for the fact that you know that you're saved because of your fruits and your endurance and all that kind of stuff. A little bit of Calvinism bleeding into that thing, and you see it here. And so that is the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Now let's talk about the Episcopalian Church, not as large a denomination. We have one here in town, and this is a, obviously a liberal group here. And this is nearly a 2 million member. And I know there are some offshoots, smaller denominations and so forth, but this is the main branch. And I'll read to you from their website. Christians affirm that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus constitute the climax of salvation history. Jesus is our Savior who redeems us from sin and death. Amen! Praise the Lord! See, it's not some of the truth they say. What did Satan say in the Garden of Eden? He said three-quarters of the truth. As we share Christ's life, we are restored to right relationship with God and one another. Despite our sins and insufficiency, we are made righteous and justified in Christ. We share saving benefits of Jesus' victory over sin and death. Without God's help for our salvation, we die with Adam, but we live in Christ as we share his life by faith. Christ has brought us out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. Salvation in Christ is made available to us through the Spirit, especially in the life, here we go, Episcopalians, which that's just the Anglicans over here that can't speak Latin, especially in the life and sacraments of the church. By the water of baptism, we are buried with Christ in His death and share, you see that thing He just said earlier? I read it to you. You probably didn't catch it. All this double speak. As we share Christ's life, we are restored to right relationship with God. So you want to have the right relationship to God, which to them is salvation. You have to share in Christ's life. How do you do that? You get baptized. Jesus was baptized. Especially in the life and sacraments of the church, by the water of baptism... We are buried with Christ in His death and share in His resurrection. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches by spirit baptism that you're put into Christ. Not by water baptism. I've given you that on several of, several of our lessons. The consecrated elements of the Eucharist, there's a Roman Catholic term, or for God's people, the bread and life of the cup of salvation by which we share the body and blood of Christ. Here's their statement on baptism. In the waters of baptism, we are lovingly adopted by God into God's family. I taught you about adoption on the, one of the last lessons. And the Bible doesn't teach that you're adopted into God's family by baptism. The Bible teaches you're adopted into God's family by faith. Galatians chapter 4. We were lovingly adopted by God into God's family into which, uh, which we call the church. We believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Now, Presbyterian Church in America. Now, there are several offshoots of the Presbyterians. And I'm well aware that you had a lot of old-time Methodists and old-time Presbyterians that were saved. And I'm not saying that you don't have some Episcopalians and even Roman Catholics that are saved despite the teachings of their church. But they sure didn't get saved by hearing a clear presentation from their rector or their minister. Um, I'll just put my sheet behind here. 
Um, Presbyterian Church USA, I mean, I'm sorry, Presbyterian Church in America, PCA, they're close to 400,000 members. Now, this is the conservative branch that split off several years back from the Presby other Presbyterian churches. They are anti-abortion, anti-sodomy, and they're more uh, traditional. However, I'm going to give you the Calvinism stuff. They subscribe to the same Westminster Confession of Faith that all the other Reformed um, uh, denominations subscribe to. Here we go under free will. Now this is the modern English version of the Westminster Confession. God has given man a will which by nature is free. It is not forced or, or necessarily inclined toward good or evil. Number two, in his state of innocence man had complete freedom and the natural ability to will and to do what is good and pleasing to God. God also made man so that he could lose that freedom. Number three, man fell into a state of sin by his disobedience and so completely lost his ability to will any spiritual good involving salvation. Consequently, fallen man is by nature completely opposed to spiritual good, is dead to sin, and is unable by his own strength either to convert himself or to prepare himself for conversion. Now that's the teaching when I gave you the stuff on Calvinism under irresistible grace, and total depravity. They teach that the man's will is totally depraved. You can't consciously make a choice or prepare your heart for Christ or receive Christ because you're so depraved. Therefore, God must irresistibly overcome you to give you the faith in order for you to believe. So it's really God believing for you. You don't make the choice because you've been elected and predestined before the foundation of the world. You say, what is that? That's garbage. Chapter 10, effectual calling. At the right time appointed by him, God effectually calls all those and only those whom he has predestined to life. He calls them by his word and spirit out of their natural state of sin and death into grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. <laughs> he enlightens their minds spiritually. There's that irresistible grace. With a saving understanding of the things of God. He takes away their heart of stone and gives them a heart of flesh. He renews their wills and by his almighty power leads them to what is good. And so he effectually draws them to Jesus Christ, but they come to Jesus voluntarily. What, what kind of double speak is that? Having been made willing by God's grace. You mean, okay, you're forced into it. It's like, you know, here you are. You see this couple getting married and the lady's standing there and she's trembling and she's all emotional and you're thinking, man, she just really loves her husband and she's saying the vows. But the, all you can see is her head and his head. You can't see what's behind her head. And about six inches from her head off the screen, there's an AR-15 pointed at her head forcing her, for, forcing her to say those words. How can you have a... A loving God who coerces and strong arms people into voluntarily receiving Christ. What kind of garbage is that? You talk about, what is this? This is religion. This is Cain versus Abel. And I'll try to sum that up at the end when we get done. Religion is what man does in double speak, using religious words, using theological jargon, using Bible verses, because the devil is religious. And the devil wants to damn as many people as he can, and he'll start by damning those who have an interest in trying to find out what they need to do to get to heaven so they go to church. And you got some reprobate preacher telling them this stuff by way of peace and love and bless you and holy water and let's light a candle because candles symbolize light and that's why we have ceremonies it's a bunch of garbage it's religion it's not salvation chapter 14 saving faith the gift of faith makes it possible for the souls of the elect to be saved by believing in Jesus Christ this gift is the work of the Spirit of Christ in the hearts of the elect and is ordinarily accomplished by the ministry of the Word. It is also increased and strengthened by the Word, by prayer, and, here we go, Presbyterians, Reformers, by the administration of the sacraments. Presbyterian Church USA. Now, this is the liberal church. A couple of blocks from us, we have one of these Presbyterian Church USA. They... Um, believe in ordaining sodomites and all kind of things. One million members, approximately. Here's a quote from them on baptizing infants. Of course, your Methodist baptized infants and your 
Reformed, Orthodox, and uh, uh, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Catholics. Baptizing infants. Being gifted with the Holy Spirit. The Scriptures speak of the Spirit's presence as anointing. In some mysterious way, the act of baptism brings with it the anointing, the presence of the Holy Spirit. The practice of making the sign of the cross on a person's forehead or similar acts demonstrate the anointing power of water. So what is that? That's Catholicism. You know, the Bible says in Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. A cross is a curse. Put a curse, put an X, put a mark on their forehead. All right, here we go. United Methodist Church, 12 million people worldwide, 6 million in the United States. Here's the article they have in their statement of faith on the sacraments. We believe the sacraments ordained by Christ are symbols and pledges of the Christian's profession and of God's love toward us. They are means of grace. Sounds awful Catholic. Means of grace, that means it's imparting something. They are means of grace by which God works invisibly in us, quickening, that's to give life, strengthening and confirming our faith in Him. Two sacraments are ordained by Christ our Lord, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper. We observe baptism. We believe baptism signifies entrance into the household of faith and is a symbol of repentance and inner cleansing from sin, a representation of the new birth in Christ Jesus, and a mark of Christian discipleship. We believe children are under the atonement of Christ, and as heirs of the kingdom of God are acceptable subjects for Christian baptism. Children of believing parents, through baptism, become the special responsibility of the church. They should be nurtured and led to personal acceptance of Christ, and by profession of faith, confirm their baptism. We believe the Lord's Supper is a representation of our redemption, a memorial of the suffering and death of Christ, and as a token of love and union which Christians have with Christ and with one another. Those who rightly, worthily, and in faith eat the broken bread and drink the blessed cup, partake of the body and blood of Christ in a spiritual manner until He comes. Now let's go back to this thing about baptism. They make the statement, as do the Presbyterians, that later on that child, that infant, needs to profess faith in Christ. If you know anything about John Ed Jonathan Edwards and the Great Awakening, you know that he had a whole church full of unsaved people because they had been baptized, which made them members of the church, but they were not converted. Now with the Methodists, what they do, they have a situation where later on you stand up and you make your profession of faith. They call it their vows. And they stand up and go through uh, pro proclaiming that they've trusted Christ and so forth. Um, they do make the statement that they also will baptize, obviously, an adult if they haven't been baptized in, as an infant. But it's an amazing thing here. They make this statement about baptism and profession. They say, unlike what some may tell you, just because you are an adult does not mean you have to be ready to profess the baptism, the baptismal and membership vows yourself in order to receive Christian baptism. So they're saying they can have an adult who will get baptized, you know, they'll pour water on his head generally. Now Methodists will take them down and put them in if they want to be immersed. But they'll put sprinkle water on their heads, which by the way, is not the biblical mode of baptism at all. Acts chapter number 8, they both went down into the water and he baptized them. Matthew chapter 3, Jesus Christ goes down into the water. You do not have to go down into water unless you are immersed under the water. Do you get that? You could obviously, I'm sure they had bowls and they had little things to carry water just like the woman at the well. She had those pitchers. They had ways to have water to sprinkle on your head. They went down into the water because they were immersed. It's a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. It's a picture because you baptize them backwards down into the water. Anyway, they're making the statement here that in, in the Methodist church, you can be baptized, but you don't have to stand up and make a profession. Now, Acts chapter number 8, when he looks at that eunuch, he says... The eunuch says, I want to be baptized. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Acts 8, 36, 37, 38. 
Philip says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Imagine baptizing somebody even if they're not ready to make a profession. Justification and regeneration. Here we go, United Methodist Church. We believe and are never, we believe we are never accounted righteous before God through our own works or merit. Woo, that sounds great. But that penitent sinners are justified or accounted righteous before God only by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Woohoo! We believe regeneration is the renewal of man in righteousness through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, whereby we are made partakers of the divine nature and experience newness of life. By his new birth, the believer becomes reconciled to God and is enabled, enabled to serve him with the will and the affections. We believe, although we have experienced regeneration, it is possible to depart from grace and fall into sin, and we may even then, by the grace of God, be renewed in righteousness. There's Arminianism that teaches that you can lose your salvation. Have you ever talked to somebody, so do you say, they say, well, uh, you know, I asked Jesus to save me, but I've gotten out in the world, and I've, I've done things, and I, I, I don't think I'd go to heaven. Why do they believe that? Either, number one, they didn't understand what they did when they got saved, and they never really got saved, and they were just confused. Or, more than likely, they have been taught somewhere down the line, and here we go with, with, uh, with Method, Methodist teaching from John Wesley, that you can lose your salvation. Article number 10, good works. We believe good works are necessary fruits of faith and follow regeneration, but they do not have the virtue to remove our sins or to avert divine judgment. We believe good works, pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ, spring from a true and living faith, for through and by them faith is made evident. Here is where Arminianism and Calvinism are wedded. They're married together because they say justification by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. In other words, a Calvinist says you have to prove that you're one of the elect by good works. So if you lose your good works and you fall out of church and you're not doing right and you start uh, doing what they consider wrong, then you never were one of the elect to start with because the elect always perseveres because they believe in eternal security because you've been chosen before the foundation of the world. However, Arminians, on the other hand, they believe you can lose your salvation, but they say here, good works are necessary, and they follow regeneration. They're pleasing and acceptable. They spring from a true and living faith. A true and living faith produces. So his, this idea of truly saved, and that thing bleeds over even into Bible-believing, Bible Baptist teaching, well... If you don't come back to church on Sunday night, maybe you ain't really saved to start with. If you don't desire to read your Bible every day, maybe you aren't really saved. If you haven't been tithing 20 or 30% of your income, you might not really be saved. Where does the thing stop? It stops based on the level of fruit that you put as the fruit inspector. Sanctification and Christian perfection. We believe sanctification is the work of God's grace through the Word and the Spirit by which those who have been born again are cleansed from sin in their thoughts, words, and acts and are enabled to live in accordance with God's will and to strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Entire sanctification is a state of perfect love, righteousness, and true holiness which every regenerate believer may obtain by being delivered from the power of sin. This is from Methodists. This comes from John Wesley way back in the colonial days. And of course your holiness movement springs out of this sinless perfectionism stuff. So when you study Pentecostalism, you study the holiness, holiness movement, which had some roots in the fundamentalist movement, but it had roots in the Methodist teaching of sinless perfectionism. Let's see. Through faith in Jesus Christ, this gracious gift may be received in this life both gradually and instantaneously and should be sought earnestly by every child of God. We believe this experience does not deliver us from the infirmities, ignorance, and mistakes common to man, nor from the possibilities of further sin. The Christian must be on guard against spiritual pride to seek to gain favor over every temptation. He must respond wholly to the will of God so that sin will lose its power over him. The world, the flesh, and the devil are put under his feet. Thus he rules over these enemies with watch through the power of the Holy Spirit. Communion. This is the Methodist Church. This is what they say. 
when we receive the bread and wine, so we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by His blood, we are remembering at the same time we are re-membered. Re put back together again. We pray that we may be one with Christ and one with each other in the ministry to all the world. God's work of making us one and uniting us with Christ and with each other is the ordinary way by which God feeds us, sustains us, empowers us to live as Christians in the world. In communion, we do remember the saving work God has already done for the world. That's the biblical teaching of the Lord's Supper is memorial. Looking back, look what Christ did. He gave His body. He shed His blood for us. So that's right. And we anticipate God's future for the world and all creation. We're partners with God in creating this future. We are strengthened and transformed, here we go, by the presence of Christ in the bread and wine to respond to God's love by loving God and others. This idea of the presence of Christ being in the waters of baptism, this is Methodists, talk, or Episcopalians talking about the water and the power to... Uh, to put you in the family of God. And here with the Methodists, the presence of Christ, that stuff goes back to Catholicism. John Wesley used John 3, 5 as a proof text for the new birth, being born of water. So does Martin Luther. And that comes in Catholicism as well. You're born again by removing original sin on that baby by putting the water on them. Now these Protestants, if they understood fully Roman Catholicism and the teaching... Maybe they would shy away from this stuff. Maybe not. I think the problem is they don't believe the Bible is the absolute authority. Therefore, they won't question their teachings. This stuff comes out of Rome. You take the baby and you better put water on him real quick. Holy water, that is, from Rome. Roman Catholic holy water. You better put the holy water on him to take the original sin off of him so he'll have a chance. And they also have procedures for aborted fetuses and so forth. That's Catholic. Presence of Christ in the bread and wine, that is transubstantiation in Roman Catholicism, which is cannibalism, which teaches that Jesus Christ is turned, or the bread and wine is turned into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Protestantism teaches consubstantiation, which is kind of a, here we go again, just double speak, and then here you see it trickling down into the Methodist. Here we go with heaven and hell with the Methodists. Do they go directly to heaven or hell or to a holding place until Christ returns for final judgment? Throughout history, people have wondered what happens immediately after death. While, and this is all from the official United Methodist website. Don't think that I'm defaming anybody. You say, well, I know so-and-so, and they're saved just like me, and we have good fellowship, and they're a Methodist. Yeah, they're probably listening to a different preacher on the radio and getting fed by him. Or maybe their preacher doesn't subscribe to all their teachings. They're getting fed from somewhere, not from their garbage on their official their official publications. Watered down trash. Do they go directly to heaven and hell? Throughout history, people have wondered what happens immediately after death. While we may want a clear-cut answer, United Methodists do not provide one in our doctrinal statements. This is because the Scriptures themselves offer no one clear teaching on what happens to the dead between their death and the resurrection and judgment at the last day. Oh, really? <laughs> Philippians chapter number 1, Paul said... I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Oh, really? 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, where Paul says, We want to be clothed, with our house, uh, clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. My goodness. Assembly of God, let me give these two and then we'll be done. I'll pull in the Pentecostal flavor. So you might want to go ahead and do a dance around the room. Assembly of God, 60 million, 69 million worldwide. 3 million in the United States. The salvation of man. Pretty good stuff right here when you look at the stuff on salvation. Man's only hope of redemption is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Conditions to salvation. Salvation is received through repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, being justified by grace through faith, man becomes an heir of God according to the hope of eternal life. Then they have evidence of salvation. The inward evidence of salvation is the direct witness of the Spirit. The outward evidence to all men is a life of righteousness and true holiness. Here we come with the... Initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This comes out of the late 1800s, 1906, 
with the movements out in California. I gave you some information on that previously. The Assurance of Salvation Proposition, a position paper adopted by the General Presbytery in session August the 5th, 2017. This is the General Council of the Assemblies of God. And it says that they disapprove of the unconditional security position which holds that it's impossible for a person once saved to be lost. That's in their bylaws. Assembly of God, they teach you can lose your salvation like the Methodists. The following biblical teachings sustain and guide the believers grow in maturity and perseverance in their relationship with Christ. Salvation is available for every person. Salvation is received and assured through faith. Salvation is an ongoing conflict with temptation and sin. The believer's salvation may be forfeited or abandoned by willfully turning away from Christ. And what they give is proof text or verses out of Hebrews and 2 Peter, verses that deal with salvation in the Great Tribulation written to Hebrews, not to Christians in the New Testament dispensation of the church age. Church of God, 7 million members, not as big as the Assembly of God. The principal distinctive of the Church of God as a Pentecost organization is the belief in speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And that is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They're real strong on that position, whereas the Assembly of God are not as strong on the speaking in tongues for the initial evidence. They believe you can lose your salvation. Um, I will try to, for the sake of time... Try to finish this up. Here we go with this whole process. You've noticed probably through this whole thing that they keep saying all the way back with the very liberal Lutherans, the very liberal Presbyterian USA, this idea of salvation is a present thing that we're working toward. Here we go. Scriptures teach that personal salvation is a process from conversion to glorification. But once saved, always saved, makes glorification inevitable, regardless of the quality of the character of the believer. You're right. Salvation, however, does not depend simply on the gift of life we receive at the moment of conversion, but on a continual relationship with God in which we appropriate the blessings of God by faith. Here you have it. Two problems and two heresies. Heresy number one. In order to get saved, there are some things you have to do in order to get God's grace. Whether it be a small thing or a large thing. Whether it's somebody throwing water on your head as a baby, or it's somebody throwing water on your head as an adult, or it's somebody giving you a piece of bread to eat, or it's keeping certain rituals, whatever it is. In layman's terms, i got to be a good person. That's Cain's religion. Cain brought the fruit. This is what I did. I worked on this garden. I told the ground. I brought it. Have respect to my religion. I'm trying to justify myself. That's heresy number one. Trying to be saved by works, by deeds. What man's trying to do to justify himself. That's what all these religions are doing. Protestant, supposedly evangelical religions. Heresy number two, you might get it right. Wesley had it right. They preached salvation by grace through faith. Some of the Presbyterians and some of the Reformed people, they preach salvation right. People can get converted listening to that part of the truth of the gospel message. But, as far as Wesley and as far as the Pentecostals go, they say, you're saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of Christ, but you've got to do good works and have the right kind of character in order to keep it or you're going to forfeit it. Two bad heresies. What does the Bible teach? Romans 5.18 Therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Romans chapter 10 Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's cut through the chaos. The simplicity of the gospel is that Jesus died for your sins. He accomplished redemption. If you believe on Him, He'll save you. He'll give you everlasting light. That's your position in Christ. Your practical life, your, your standing in Christ is absolute sinlessness. Your state can be in and fluctuate based on your walk with Christ. That is the New Testament's teaching of salvation. Lord bless the Lesson, Lord, help us to see through the chaos and cut through the confusion. I pray, God, we could be a clear gospel witness for those who are confused. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.